Somewhere in the North Sea, a British cruiser is returning to base with the marks of heavy action upon her. She is listing badly to port. Her speed is cut down to less than half. Altering course is a major operation, so she can't manoeuvre. This ship of the Royal Navy has come through one engagement, but she's a sitting bird if the enemy tries again. Thick clouds of smoke drifting upwards from the decks are the aftermath of an early morning attack by enemy aircraft. Low level and high altitude. German long-range bombers came screaming at her with everything from torpedoes to rocket bomb. Yes, that cruiser was attacked by enemy aircraft. But the newsreel doesn't tell the whole story. You see, it wasn't the skill or the strength of the enemy attack that put her out of action. There's no need for a name. Let's call her the Andromeda, near enough. A fine fighting ship. One of the largest cruisers in the Royal Navy. She could give and she could take it. She had everything that science could devise to help her stand up to just such an attack. And yet you've just seen her, a blazing, flooded hulk. Seven of her complement were to blame. Seven men, each with a mistake on his conscience. But now we've had another film made, which the public won't be able to see, because it tells the secret of what really happened to the Andromeda. But you'll be able to see it. And if you can put up with me, I'll try and explain it as we go along. But let's start at the very beginning. Are you ready, projection? Let's go. Did you know a warship, your ship, started as a wax model? These models are tested. Here you are, shown for the very first time in a film for your benefit. It takes place in a shed 900 foot long and plays an important part in making sure that the finished ship will have the maximum efficiency. Each new ship is a development of a forerunner in speed, navigability, facility and manoeuvre. All the lessons learned in actual combat. 100 draftsmen from 10 different technical departments are employed in planning her. Literally thousands of working drawings are made to be translated eventually into terms of wood and metal. Ever been to a shipyard? I've been to one or two myself. They're more exciting than you'd think. You can see there the draftsman's drawings enlarged up, as it were, to life size, and feel that you're really in on the birth of a ship. People are inclined to think of shipbuilding in terms of slipways. This work actually takes place in a mold loft. There's a tremendous amount of preliminary work to be carried out in the workshop. Drilling, countersinking, shearing, planing, rolling. All these are necessary before what you might call the larger construction can take place. Important work, but not perhaps the most exciting part of shipbuilding. That comes later. It's when you do get to the slipway that you begin to realize what it's all about. These are only tiny units of the hull. You'll see in a minute how the ship grows from them like an oak tree from an acorn. What a wonderful thing it would be if every sailor could see his ship in construction. He would get an idea of the terrific responsibility a ship's company has towards its ship when he's seen all the skill and craftsmanship that goes into the making of her. You might say that each one has been split up into thousands of small component parts and put into the care of hundreds of teams of expert workers. We don't go in for mass production. Our ships are all handmade. Each single part is individually fitted into the jigsaw puzzle that at last becomes a warship. Eighteen months have gone by since that wax model passed her tests. Eighteen months of hard work. And here's what we've got to show for it. A hull, but still empty of engines, armament and all fitting. A whole community of men has worked non-stop on her these eighteen months. Shift succeeding shift. Engineers, carpenters, fitters, riveters, painters, welders. But she still isn't a ship. She becomes that when she's launched, the really big moment of her life.
Well, now that's over. But the hull's still got to be fitted. The boilers are brought out of their sheds. Pretty hefty, these boilers. And there are eight of them all ready to be lowered in. Eight of them, and each one develops 10,000 horsepower. Each one weighs 58 tons. And between them, they hold 120 tons of water. They're lowered in by tremendous cranes, which pick them up and put them down, like one of those grab machines in a fun fur. That's how it looks at any rate. But actually, it's quite a considerable feat, because, don't forget, the decks must be cut open to let them through to their final home. Now they're in. But there'll still be weeks of fitting before they're finally tested. I'll just give you an idea of the work and material entailed in building a cruiser. In steel, the equivalent of 250 tanks. In manpower, the production of 2,000 heavy bombers. But that's by the way. Where were we? We just got the boilers in, and now the decks have had to be resealed and the superstructure built up on top. And with the superstructure, all the numberless installations and gadgets that bring a ship to life. Once these are in, it's testing, testing, testing. Watertight doors have to be proved watertight. Engineers have to make sure that they fit with the same high degree of accuracy as the bridge of a gun. Just as the guns represent the offensive spirit of the ship, so these doors stand for her ability to withstand attack. And here they come, the men of HM ship Andromeda. Old hands, new hands, all shapes and sizes, all walks of life. They are moving to their new home. Meet some of them. Hey, you. His name's Jackson, Stoker second class. Comes from the Midlands. The Andromeda is his first ship. All right, Jackson, see you later. Here's another stoker, and watch him salute. The name of this stoker who can't salute is Handel, and he's a Londoner. You'll see more of him. The first arrivals have turned the wireless on, and now they're pouring into every mess deck like jellies into moulds. Here's a proper old stripey who's seen a few mess decks in his time. Bailey is a seaman torpedoman. Look at his happy and contented face. Ordinary Seaman Martin, he's another Londoner, damage control messenger when the ship's in action. Near enough a thousand men will live in the Andromeda, so meet a few more. Smith, yes, that's his real name. Smithy says he used to be a city man. Well, he's a rating now. Here's Martin again. Don't worry, you'll see that picture again. In the petty officer's mess, you always get a lot of old ships meeting again. Up the Straits, wasn't it? That's right, the old Coventry. And this is Shipwright Allen. He isn't one of the seven men of our story, but just watch what happened to him in the end. He suffered because of them. How about the officers? They're settling in too. Not so bad. I've seen worse. Sub-Lieutenant J. Evans, blundered to his friends, takes over his cabin. And last, but certainly not least, the captain. He's lost his gear twice in this war, but he lives in hopes. Anyway, he's collected a new lot. Officers and men. The ship's company is now complete. It always seems amazing how quickly they settle in. Managed to get any leave?
routine. Well, you and I know what that means. These fellows who make films are apt to glamorize things, and it all looks easy and comfortable in this film. We know it's hard work, and lots of it too, but it's got to be done. P.T., quarters clean guns, tube drill. A life on the ocean waves, mostly exercises and drills, whatever the poets say. This is one of the four turrets of the four-inch guns. And here's another of the characters of our story. Seaman gunner Phil Potts. And he comes from a good sailor country, Devon. Phil Potts is the last but one of the seven men I'm going to ask you to watch. Seven ordinary fellows doing the same jobs that I expect many of you are doing in your ship. The last character you'll meet in a moment. Like Phil Potts, he's a gunnery rating. Like Phil Potts, he's a clue to what happened in the Andromeda. And here he is. Davis comes from Cardiff, and they breed them tough in Cardiff. Davis is one of the pom-pom layers. Right. PT, quarters pin guns, routine. I don't suppose there's a sailor in the world that hasn't got the word routine engraved on his heart. Lectures, too. Every sailor also has to take these, and take them in, what's more. Lecture on firefighting. The petty officers explaining to them, they'll find these appliances all over the ship. They've got to know where to find them, and they've got to know how to use them. All emergencies have to be taken into consideration. Teams are trained to fight fires. Others have other duties. And this is all just exercise, too. A message is brought in to the officer in charge of damage control. He gives his orders. The teams are given their instructions. Three parties are sent to the spot. The damage is plotted on the flooding board. First come the torpedo men with the electrical gear. Then the repair squad ready to shore up any damaged bulkheads. Finally, the portable pump party. Another lecture, this time on first aid. The bugbear of every ship's doctor is the sailor's neglect to protect himself from gun flashes. If you don't want your ankles burnt, this is what you do. If you wear a short-sleeved vest, you're liable to cop it in the arm. And here's another snag to remember. Any exposed flesh is vulnerable. Meanwhile, if you haven't done as you've been told, it's just as well to know how to deal with burns. Not only when the ship's in harbour, but at sea too, the lectures go on. It's all a part of the working up period. Learning to unwrap a dressing properly may not be everybody's idea of entertainment, but this doctor's a Scot with a sense of humour, and he's got a good audience. Lectures on every subject, and a lot of them, of course, on ship safety, opening and closing watertight doors and hatches. Relaxation. Unless you happen to be musical, in which case get out of earshot. It won't be a stylish marriage. I can't afford a carriage. I should have upon the seat of the bicycle lane. And so another day dawns. And that's how life goes on. Scrub forward and get well into them corners. Go on well into them corners. Remember those boilers we saw fitted? There's nothing much to see now except shining metal, dials and other gadgets. But this time you can hear them. Out to sea for full calibre firing. These exercises are also a part of the ship's routine. But there's more to them than PT or scrubbing decks. It's a dog watch firing, so the old hands, off duty, get their heads down. They can sleep through anything. Back to harbour. 
Hard to see again. Night firing. And if the novices haven't got used to it by night time, well, it's a sleepless night. And now the Andromeda's testing period is over. She and her crew function as one and both are ready for action. I said earlier that I'd try and explain this film as we go along. But here's someone who also wants to drive the lesson home. The captain addresses the ship's company. I want to say a word now about something less obvious, but just as vital to our efficiency as a fighting unit. I'm referring to the watertight safety rules. They've been fully explained to you during your training and since you came aboard. And there are notices in all parts of the ship to remind you of them. Yet there have been cases of those rules being disregarded. I know perfectly well it's a wearisome business securing hatches and fixing ten clips on a door every time you have to go through it. But those doors and hatches are not put there just to make things difficult. They are put there to safeguard you and your ship. Close them properly, always. And don't leave loose gear lying about. Keep your ship tidy, every part of her. If you fail to observe these simple rules, all the skill and care the designers have put into her will have been wasted. You may think these things are only worth bothering about when there's an immediate prospect of our being in action. But on a routine job, it doesn't matter. That's a most dangerous assumption. In war, a routine job can turn very suddenly into something else. Come in. Good morning, Grant. Good morning, sir. Signal just received. All right, Grant. As you go, Father, tell the engineer commander I'd like a word with him. Aye, aye, sir. First patrol in the North Sea. On a grey November morning, hardly any sea but a biting wind. The morning when seven fateful mistakes were made on board the Andromeda. Down in the engine room, Stoker Handle is sent off to make an inspection of the propeller shaft glands. Bailey, the seaman torpedoman, number two in our story, is testing the fuses in the switch room. And this is what he thinks. If I drop it down, it'll do for now. No one will notice. And I've got to come and finish off anyway. No, nobody will notice it, Bailey. And that's the whole trouble. Here's number three, Stoker Jackson. He thinks, oh, that means me. Better finish off after the fall in. Hey, don't leave that can of oil there. Look. Who's that? Oh, it's Stoker Handel coming back. He's our number one. And listen to him. I'd like a quid for every time I've done this job. As for fixing these bloody clips, I know I'm supposed to push them down, but it's easier and quicker to push them up. It looks just as good to me. It may look just as good. That's Handel's mistake. It isn't. While all this was going on, life on the mess deck was just the same as usual. The five-minute warning had gone, but that means four minutes and 59 seconds to go. Smithy, our number four, the city man, believes in keeping up appearances. Number five, Martin, ordinary seaman, for the tenth time this trip is reading a letter from his girlfriend. Come on, hurry up. We'll be late. Just come in. That's right. Go and leave the locker door open. And what's your towel doing there, Smith? Here's number six. 
Philpotts. So loaded up to avoid two trips that he's a walking advertisement for more haste, less speed. Hey, John. What's up, man? Come up here a minute and help with these helmets. Okay. Take a couple of here as well. Davis, our number seven, is always one to help another chap out of trouble and to get into trouble himself. Now look what you've done. Look at that open hatch. Leave it, come on. Leave it, forget it, don't bother. Bailey said nobody would notice he'd left the hatch open. He was right. These two didn't see it. Come in. A signal, sir. All right. Seven mistakes and an officer's carelessness thrown in for good measure. Now our scene is set. Don't like the look of these low clouds. Aircraft. Angle of sight, five three. Very likely got some pals with him somewhere. Here they are. Aircraft coming toward. Angle of sight one. The enemy hoped to surprise the Andromeda, but all those weeks of training now prove their value. Think what ships like the Andromeda have done in this war. The Graf Spade, the Bismarck, the Scharnhorst. Time and time again, they've been at the enemy's throat. Time and time again, their guns have paved the way for the bigger ships to come in for the kill. Seamanship, training and efficiency have made their record possible. But the skill of the navigators, the marksmanship of the gunners, quality of construction is not enough. The behavior of the ship's crew can decide between victory and disaster. Their behavior not only in battle, but at all times. What about our seven sailors we've already met in the Andromeda? What was their record? Not a very good one. Stoker Handel, he pushed the clips up. Stoker Jackson, he left the can of oil. Ordinary Seaman Martin, he left his locker open. Lieutenant Evans, he didn't put his book away. A red hot spinter did this. Hey, don't run for help. Extinguishers here, you should know that. But let's go back and see what happened when that first bomb fell. The action was over. Damage to the enemy, one plane destroyed, another unlikely to get home. And what about the Andromeda? Two near misses either side aft. One of them a delayed action below the waterline. Not so very much after all. This model shows exactly what flooding this damage has caused and how it has affected the ship. We have slowed up the movement of the water quite a lot so that you can see clearly how it mounts up through the ship. It's that black stuff going up. Do you remember? This is where Stoker Handel came up from the gland compartment. The delayed action near miss on the port side, 
has caused immediate flooding through splinter holes of the gland compartment, a small fuel tank, and a switch room compartment. Here's that same black flood water. This is the third of the compartments affected, the switch room. The flooding of these three small compartments, containing only 200 tons of water, makes up the entire unavoidable damage so far suffered by the Andromeda from the enemy. It has given her a slight list of approximately five degrees. Reports of damage were coming into damage control headquarters. Splinter holes in three after compartments, all well above the waterline. And, as we know, some plates below the waterline damaged on the port side aft. Three compartments affected. You've seen so far what the enemy did in this attack, but now you're going to see the harm done by those first four mistakes of the men on board her. No other compartments are open to the sea, yet the flood keeps on spreading. Why? I'll show you. Inside the hull at the top of the gland compartment. Do you remember? Handle has failed to clip the watertight door properly. Soon the surrounding compartment is well flooded. Yes, this is the door. And Handle thought? As for fixing these bloody clips, I know I'm supposed to push them down. It's easier and quicker to push them up. It may look just as good. It isn't. This water-coloured white is the flood which four men are directly responsible for. Above the switch room, where Bailey left the hatch open, there is no barrier to the water pressure from below. If I drop it down, it'll do for now. No one will notice, and I've got to come and finish off anyway. Nobody will notice it, Bailey. That's the whole trouble. And a further 200 tons of unwanted water add to Andromeda's rapidly increasing list. As this water spreads, it finds more gateways. Phil Potts and Davis have passed this way, leaving another hatch open, as well as another watertight door. Leave it, come on. Roughly speaking, within three minutes of the attack, 800 tons of flood water are weighing down Andromeda's port side. 600 of them due entirely to neglect of duty. Davis, how long would it have taken you to close that hatch? The flooding might stop, but 800 tons of water mean an 8 degree list. And with this 8 degrees, the flooding, which has now reached the level of the sea outside, gradually slows up and eventually stops altogether. It stops there, yes, but its effect further aft is disastrous. Splinter holes in cabins right aft, up till now, well above the waterline are brought below the waterline by the extra list. Look how quickly this cabin is filling. Approximately three minutes after the dropping of that first bomb, a thousand tons of water have entered the after compartments, giving the ship a ten degree list. The diesel flat. The situation is not lost. The lower compartments, being the last to fill, are slow to reach their flood limit and the open hatches, which have caused all the trouble, are still just visible above the water. The damage is quickly located. Out go the lights. That's almost inevitable when a switch room is flooded. The damage control parties have got to try to work in clouds of choking black smoke. Now I want to show you what the last three mistakes caused. But you will see more of them in a minute. Yes, Jackson. He left the can of oil. The fifth mistake. Better finish off after the fall then. The fire spreads from the oil to the tins of paint, and then to the stowed hammocks. These give off that very thick smoke. much pressure. We can't close it. <coughs> We'd better get this smoke down first.
Shipwright Allen makes a desperate attempt to summon help. None of this was his fault, but he's an innocent victim of those seven mistakes. list is increasing. The captain looks pretty worried, and he's damn good reason to be. Another message from damage control. And while the pumps above are working full out, a message from DC to the petty officer in charge. Bump above the fatted mystic. What's happened now? Captain's secretary has just finished deciphering a message. Even at a time like this, the ciphers must still be locked up. All the years of building, all the training, all the working up were in preparation for this. Engage the enemy. The great moment has come. But there can be no engaging the enemy for Andromeda. Crippled by her own crew, she'll be lucky if she can even get back to harbour. Most of the ship's company, of course, have got to remain at the guns. There might be another attack. But down below, the remainder are trying to pump out all this extra water. It looks as if the suction of this pump above the flooded cabin flat is blocked too. Yes, Sub Lieutenant Evans. He left his book lying loose in his cabin. Damage control to PO in charge after pump party. Extra help unavailable at present. Retain messenger spare hand. You stay here, Blake. Come with me, Martin. The smoke is getting worse. The pumps cannot be worked for more than a few minutes at a time. What's happened to the hand that first went below? Why is there still no suction? Martin is sent to find out. <coughs> Making his way around the mess deck is a nightmare now, with the dark and the smoke and the water and the gas mask with its pipeline and the lifeline that hampers every movement. Do you remember, Martin? Come on, hurry up. We'll be late. They're just coming. That's your picture. And Smith's Tull is there too. Mistakes number six and seven. And you can be sure there's plenty more gear from your open locker lying round loose and ready to jam the suctions again. Who's this? It's the hand who first came down to see what was choking the pumps. He hurt his knee. 
Couldn't get away fast enough, and the smoke did the rest. Martin hears all about the smoke. We've got him down. There's something more important, Martin, than helping one injured man. It's to safeguard your ship. It's to safeguard hundreds of your mates by closing that door. And this is the end of our story. It's always a big moment when the captain addresses the ship's company. Sometimes a moment for pride. But this time... This is the captain speaking. Flooding has now taken such a serious hold on the ship that we are unable to proceed on our mission. The ship is no longer maneuverable, owing to the heavy list that has developed and which has rendered nearly all guns useless. While she still floats, however, no effort must be spared to nurse her back to harbor. Every man must do his utmost to help save the ship. Seven men. Abel Seaman Bailey. Stoker Handel. Stoker Jackson, Ordinary Seaman Smith, Ordinary Seaman Martin, Able Seaman Davis, Able Seaman Phil Potts, and Sub Lieutenant Evans. Seven ratings and an officer. And the damage they did between them to a cruiser was more than the enemy did himself. The Andromeda wasn't crippled by the enemy, but by seven men of her own company. So don't be like them.